here we go. Are we live? It says we're streaming. I'm honestly not sure if we are. Okay, we are. Not the smoothest start to an episode, especially considering I've made a whole lot of promises on Twitter and Mastodon about what we're going to accomplish tonight. But rest assured, that stuff is going to happen. This is confusing having OBS open, so at least for now, I'll just uh, keep tonight's to-do list visible while I do some tech configuration. Okay. That's looking better. Cool. Alright. Um, normally, I start things off by going over the uh, why and how. Kind of like the mission statement of the live stream, but I don't know, I'd, I'd really like to jump into the thick of things uh, to make sure that I have enough time to complete what we called Strategy 3. Um, not going to worry about what I called Strategy 4 there. Um, you may recall, Strategy 3 is... Why is... strategy notes. In the previous streams, we were iterating over the code that drives Wireworld in this engine file, um, specifically in this advanced function, uh, where we are trying to make this, this code run as fast as possible. The most resource intensive code is right here. And previously, we were looping pretty intensively around the... I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, we are... We are running locally. Okay. So the code that we execute every time this Wireworld app advances is this code in here in Engine.js. And in the past, we would iterate over every wire cell, these gray cells, counting the neighbors around them. So, you know, this cell has this neighbor and this neighbor. Technically, it also has these neighbors, these uh, empty ones that never change. But it really only should care about this one and this one. But originally, we were basically looping over every 3x3 three three neighborhood around every wire cell, counting the neighbors that are heads that are this color and changing the state of that cell from wire or gray to head or orange if the number of head neighbors is one or two, according to the rules of Wireworld. What we did in the last stream was we replaced that 3x3 three three loop. What we are doing instead is when we start the simulation, or really when we, when we load the simulation, from the file into the engine. We're creating 
a grid that they all live in, which makes sense. Uh, but instead of just being the state, you know, dead, wire, head, or tail, we're storing a whole object right here. This cell grid contains null wherever there's dead cells in the initial configuration. But everywhere else, we are creating a cell object and putting it in the grid. And then in this loop, again, this is in the initialization of the engine. In this loop, we are constructing a list of neighbors for each cell. So that when we end up advancing through the simulation and doing the hard work of counting the number of neighbors of each wire cell that are ahead, we can just iterate over that cell's list of neighbors. So this cell just has a list with two neighbors in it. These dead cells are ignored. The center cell, the cell itself, that's not a neighbor. That's just a point back to itself. We skip all that logic by doing it ahead of time. And that's just leveraging one of the rules of Wireworld, which is that either a cell is dead and never changes, or it's one of these wires, heads, tails, and heads always become tails, tails always become wires. Very straightforward. The number of neighbors of a cell, as long as it's not dead, never changes. So we can calculate that once, up front, up top. Now, there are a couple bugs in this code. This num neighbors actually belongs outside that loop, which doesn't need a name. Let me just read this again. We grab the cell. Do we even use i? Technically, we could turn this into a const of for const cell of cells. We grab the xy and we push onto the neighbors and we set the num neighbors. That's reasonable. Something else I'll do. Uh, so up here we've got x, y, index, original state. Original state is kind of wordy. I'm going to rename this to first state. The state that a cell was in when it was loaded into the app. Uh, neighbors. I'm also going to put in num neighbors. Um, that's good for now. Basically, rather than like num neighbors, we use it down here. But up here, in uh, in the initial f in the initialization function, num neighbors was being kind of declared down here. And actually, I want to declare all the fields on a cell in one place. And actually, I'm going to do that in a new function. Um, const make cell equals return that. And it should take an index. first state, an x and a y. Num neighbors zero. Forgot about that. Yes, I think this is good. And then in here, make cell num cells first state x, y. That just kind of formalizes this, uh, this structure. There are advantages to doing this in browsers. Um, the idea that a cell is an object that has the fields x, y, index, 
first state, neighbors, num neighbors, um, that is called its shape. And when browsers try to uh, compile your JavaScript after it's already running, the way that they guarantee that this function, which can be past anything, right? JavaScript is kind of um, kind of casual about how you can call functions. There's no type safety, of course, but you can also leave things out and they become undefined. Um, browsers will look for, you know, things like cells having a consistent structure for the full life cycle of the application. And they can compile that into more efficient machine code. But that's kind of overthinking it. All I'm doing with make cells, I'm saying, you know, this is what a cell is. Um, straightforward. Um, yep. Also, just going to quickly rewrite this for const. Am I? No, I'm not. This is fine. This for each gives us row and y. This for each gives us the state and x. Yeah, that's fine. For const cell of cells, this works just as it did when we originally wrote the engine with that naive implementation. Uh, there is a bug, let's see, bug, loading a file resets the engine speed incorrectly. Um, that's something that I'll get to down the road. Uh, advance, write, generation, I'm gonna move generation plus plus up to the top here. Ah, another thing I'm going to do, so the advance function is kind of overloaded. Um, we expose it through engine to the wireworld file, wireworld module, um, and it just calls it when the GUI uh, step button, this advance button, is clicked. And actually, I would like that to be more indirect, so I'm going to make this be called update and update will not contain render const advance will contain update like that and then render there we go and run will contain update and then render there we go that way we don't have to mess around with this update function the way that we have been. For that matter, um, you may recall one of the things that we have been doing in the run function to test the speed of this thing is to like shove this into i is less than 60, i plus plus, into a for loop, um, and then like comment that in and out. Well, why am I doing that on stream? I've already got this check button, this checkbox, that um, the engine knows, you know, the value of. It's called turbo. So um, I'm going to do this. Uh, let count equal uh, one, and when turbo changes, count equals turbo sixty, otherwise one. And then in run for let i is zero, i is less than count i plus plus. So now when I re reload this and we press play, it's going, you know, one update per frame. And when I turn on turbo, it tries to go 60 updates a frame. And I can just leave that code in there and I don't have to worry about it. So I'm going to do that. just to make it a little easier to try these different things. Uh, right. Changing speed with keys. 
yeah, these bugs, honestly, I'm going to wait until after strategy three to fix these bugs. Uh, bug, focus, doesn't work properly in Chrome. Uh, just another bug that I discovered after last week's stream. These are lower priority than finishing strategy three in the stream. Um, right, so, uh, from strategy two, we got to this point, right, where we're iterating over every cell still, and we know from our findings uh, after strategy one, there's about 50,000 wire cells. And most of them have no neighbors, uh, no head neighbors. Uh, and that's roughly all of the cells that we loop over. We're still doing this work. We are still looping over about 50,000 cells. And 80% of that is unnecessary. So we know that there's an opportunity to go much faster. Is I in use? It's not. I'm gonna leave it there though. Um, I forget whether a const uh, of is faster or slower. I think it's slower to do the for of loop because it creates an iterator in JavaScript. So I'm just gonna leave this as it is. It's still readable. Um, and, we're, and we're looking at every cell and we're comparing, um, you know, if it's, a, if it's a tail, it becomes a wire. If it's a head, it becomes a tail. These are very inexpensive uh, and they have to happen. Every head has to become a tail. Every tail has to become a wire. The unnecessary work is here. 80% of the wires run this code unnecessarily where we count the number of head neighbors around the wire. But here's something I want to point out. Nowhere in our update function do we talk about X and Y. We still talk about time, generation increments, but space has kind of been abstracted away. We're no longer interested in whether there is a cell to the left of this cell or to the right of this cell or above or below. That question has been answered. We know that this cell has a list of neighbors containing this cell and this cell. And what that means is this whole pattern that we think of as a pixel pattern that is embedded in a grid, right? Like this is obviously a pattern in a grid, but the grid no longer matters. And we can instead think of this as um, like little blobs of metal or circuit that are connected to other blobs. It's just a big old web of blobs. It just happens to be lying on this piece of paper in an arrangement that conforms to a Cartesian grid where there are rows and columns. What we're looking at is a pattern that evolves but is no longer necessarily a pattern embedded in space, which is good. That's kind of the direction that we want to go in because if I asked you to identify what parts of this pattern have to change in the next generation, you would be hard pressed to say, oh, well, it's a certain region, right? It's not about regions. It's about locality. It's about the current heads and the current tails and the wires that are near them. So we're going to get away in strategy three, which I'll reiterate, is to create new fields, which are called, uh, yeah, head count is a good name, um, and uh, next, yeah, we don't need generation, we'll just use next. Um, we're gonna give every cell a new field in here called next. And the point of next is, and this is where I really wish I could draw what I'm talking about. Maybe there's an online drawing pad. This could go really poorly. Create, draw, share. Maybe this. Um, close. Um, layers. 
settings. One second. Transparent, make it graph paper. Thank you. Settings. Okay, cool. Okay. Great. Uh, that's a lot of that's a lot of options. But that'll do fine. Okay. So right now, um, irrespective of whether these wire cells are anywhere near the center of activity, uh, we are checking their neighbors for heads, right? What we want to do instead is we want a list of heads and tails. How am I going to draw this? Here's what I'll do. So here's an example of a 3x3 three three universe. There's only nine cells in a wire world universe, in this example wire world universe. And we're interested in this cell. No, sorry, sorry. Um, normal uh, outline, here we go. Okay, right. So this cell is a head. Gotta thicken it. Line width. There, now we're cooking with gas. Okay, so that one is a head, uh, head. and um, you know, this one is a tail, and the rest are wire. So, gray, close, wire, 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 wire. Okay, and remember, um, all of these cells still have that notion of who their neighbors are. So they have, that's too thin, uh, too thick. They still have this interconnectedness, kind of. Or it's really like this cell has a list of all of its neighbors. So this list has this neighbor in it, and 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 this neighbor in it, etc. Um, and it's just holding on to that list, right? Um, and all the cells have that. But on top of that, this head cell, one second, I need to draw another one. This head cell is in a list called heads. Oh boy. Color. Okay. Heads. Okay. And in that list, we've got these two heads. And we can loop through that list, right? We can loop through that list just like it was uh, an array. We can be like this one and this one and this one and this one. Um, maybe we're like turning them all into tails, right? So like for every head and heads, we say you're a tail and you're a tail and you're a tail and you're a tail, something like that. But we don't actually want like an array, right? We don't want to have to make a new list every time we update the entire grid. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to give each cell a property next. And next just lets the cell point to the next cell on the list. And then if we want to loop over every cell that is ahead, as long as we have a reference to one of the cells that's ahead, we can look at all of the cells in that list until um, one of the one of the next points to null. So this is called a linked list. Um, linked list. They are pretty useful, and like here, uh, this is a linked list of integers. Um, 
typically when people think of a linked list, they think, oh, there's like the next, and then there's like the content. Um, in our case, uh, if we just do next null, um, instead of it being like two separate things where the, the cargo of this node is in this box here, we're just gonna shove it in there. So it's just another property, just like X and Y. The only difference is we're gonna use it to construct lists that will weave through our um, that will weave through our grid. So you know, wherever heads are in the grid, it will link them and we'll be able to loop through them, regardless of where they are relative to everything else. What a mess. Um, that's the core of strategy three. So we're gonna add next is null, uh, head count zero. And that should be it for now, because again, I got ahead of myself and I want to, yeah, still the same speed as before. Um, there's something I want to cover before I dive too deep into it. Um, right, so X and Y are moot. This idea that a cell has an X and Y is completely irrelevant to computing, like running the engine. The engine doesn't care about X and Y anymore, um, but the drawing code does. Right? When it's time for these things to be drawn, the update paper function, and that's another to do. Uh, maybe, oh, I already wrote it here. Cool. Uh, engine, cell constructor, num neighbors, isolate update and render, um, isolate to its own module. Yeah, this can all move down to here. Cool. Okay, right. So we saw from the beginning to the end of the last episode, we saw a speed up of about uh, three times, right? It was three times faster than it was at the beginning of the, uh, of the episode. And we were kind of comparing it with this flash file that represents the state of the... Um... Thanks for joining us, Pixels here. Let me just close this. There we go. Um, glad to have you back. Right, so we were looking at this, we were comparing our progress with this flash file from 10 years ago. Um, but actually, I made a mistake. Uh, this flash file, the one that I was showing you is more like from 12 or so years ago. And the one from 10 years ago uh, had substantially more improvements. Um, so if I play this and I turn on turbo, If you look down here at the generations, this simulation is updating extremely fast. And part of that is because the strategy three that we're going to employ today was already in place in this code. Um, but it also leveraged something that we haven't leveraged yet in our JavaScript project, um, which is interestingly not unique to Flash. Um, back then it was called CrossBridge. So this technology that has fallen out of favor with the Flash platform was a way of compiling non-Flash languages, especially C and C++, compiling them into, um, this probably won't run, yeah, it won't run because it's gone, uh, compiling them into fast running Flash code. And the way they accomplished this was by augmenting the Flash player with um, some really fast operations called opcodes. And the thing is, a lot of Flash developers, like myself, didn't want to be writing C and C++ for our Flash projects that were already heavily written in ActionScript. And so folks came up with uh, clever solutions for in, uh, introducing those fast operations that were supposed to be supported just by um, by this uh, Flash CrossBridge and instead coming up with tools that could shove them... Uh, why isn't this loading? There we go. Coming up with tools that could shove these operations 
into a Flash API that would compile down to these opcodes when the uh, Flash file is generated. In other words, the code that runs so fast in Flash right now, when I have Turbo turned on in this 10-year-old Flash file, which I had left out in previous episodes, this is the fastest that it could ever go. And as we can see, it is very fast. Um, and it's not normal Flash. It's hacks or action scripts that uses um, Turbo Diesel Sport Injector, these two technologies that I was able to use back then to leverage the new functionality in the Flash player to support um, projects that would run at roughly the speed of native code. And that was fun. It was definitely obscure. A lot of people didn't do that. Uh, towards the end, there were a lot of games that tried to do that. This was during a time when Adobe and the Flash game, I guess you'd call it industry, scene, really, the Flash gaming scene, were trying to be taken more seriously. And they felt that parts of the web stack that Flash ran inside kind of delegitimized them. And so adding 3D and adding, you know, this cross bridge stuff to make everything run faster, that was their way of um, trying to be more legitimate, trying to be taken more seriously. Um, we all know where that ended up. What's interesting is it is, it has direct parallels to, for example, WebAssembly, which is, you know, a, a bytecode format that we will try to leverage down the road um, that is standardized across browsers that runs much faster than JavaScript can because JavaScript has some odd properties that in our case get compiled away most of them, like mostly um, but can cause JavaScript to be interpreted and uh, and run at slower speeds than equivalent code written in other languages or for other virtual machines. So at some point we will leverage the same uh, kind of trick as the, the old flash file. In other words, the goalposts have moved. As fast as things were at the end of the last episode, we need them to be much faster if we are going to catch up with the code that Res Mason wrote 10 years ago. In third person. That said, by the end of this stream, we should more than catch up. Strategy 3 combined with modern JavaScript and a CPU that is, you know, 10 years newer than what there was in 2011 and a browser that has been undergoing 10 more years of development, right? A JavaScript interpreter that is uh, 10 years more, more advanced than what there was in 2011. All these things are gonna add up and strategy three is going to allow us to catch up really quick. Um, so let's get back into it. So first, um, just going to quickly run this again and make sure that everything seems to be working properly. Yes, and Turbo does what we expect it to. All right. Um, and I'll run prettier because I'm about to put this code on the internet. Okay, what did it change? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, yep. Also, I'll just take a quick look at GUI.js update paper and initialize paper. Right, one other change that I wanted to make is we're passing this data object and 
properties get extracted from it. I'm going to change it so that instead engine render generation width height cells. Yeah. So all of these, I'm going to turn these into actual arguments. I just think this is, I don't know, a better, a better idea. <laughs> Get rid of that, um, and then data.generation becomes generation. It might not make that big a difference, it just seems less mysterious to me to have the uh, arguments just in the function in this case. And then uh, run prettier again. Okay. To do. Arguments not data. Make base canvas opaque. That's right. Um, so, this is not a huge deal, but when we create these, let's see. Index base. You know what? I'm not going to worry about that. That's something to try some other time. Um, meh. <laughs> okay. Right, let's get back into it. Strategy three. So, our fields now have, oh, wait a minute. So, next and head count, I'm gonna unstage. But render gets staged, and GUI gets updated. Okay. Um, here. There we are. Okay. So, um, minor refactor in engine turbo checkbox now toggles between updating once per frame or what did I set it to? Probably 60. Yeah, 60. 60 times per frame. Cool. And push. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, let's get away from this iterating over every single cell. Um, we are going to create a list. So let first head equals null, first tail equals null. Is that all we need? Yes, yes it is, okay. And the idea is this first head is gonna be the first cell in the list of cells that are heads. And first tail is gonna be the list of all tails. Uh, cells that are tails. Um, and because cells know their neighbors, we can turn the list of all heads for the last generation into the list of heads for the next generation. And also, the list of heads for generation X is going to be the list of tails for generation X plus one. So there's a whole lot of uh, cleverness that we can leverage here. Um, but obviously we need first head and first tail to, to represent something. Um, so let's see, when we initialize um, Excel, and then reset. So reset is where we're going to make these things. 
then for each cell, we're actually going to get rid of cell state entirely. Right now we rely on cell state to differentiate between the heads, tails, and wires. But what we're going to do instead is, um, heads are any cell that's in the list of heads, and tails are any cell in the list of tails. And we don't worry about whether something is a wire or not, because if you recall, uh, we don't have to draw wires. There we go. We only have to draw heads and tails because um, wires can like sit underneath the layer of heads and tails. So that's convenient. A lot of characteristics of wire world are something that we can benefit from. Uh, so cells for each cell. We're gonna say cell dot next is null. Cell dot uh, head count is zero. I'm not sure if that's even necessary. And then we're gonna say um, switch cell dot first state. So this is the state that it's in. Uh, when we want it to be reset to the case, you know, the, the scenario that it's at uh, when it begins. Case cell state dot head. Break. Case cell state tail. Break. Um, oh, you know what? There's another property that I want to add, which is called is wire false. Okay. Case cell state. Um, yeah, I might as well do it this way. Wire. Uh, we already know that if it's not a head and it's not a tail, then it's a wire. But this makes it clearer to read. And here we're going to say cell.isWire is true. And up here, um, you don't forget about head count. Cell.isWire equals false. Okay. So we're going through all the cells and we are forming these three lists. So we find a head. What do we do? Oh right, up here we also need to do first head. Oops, first head is null. First tail is null. So we, we have empty lists, right? We don't even have uh, a, like a, a pointer to a single cell. Um, so we want to make this this linked list of heads and tails. But we don't even know if there's an existing list. So first we need to say if first head is null, then um, first head equals cell. Otherwise, let's see. So first head marks the beginning we also need let last head equal null, last tail equal null. Is this more readable? I don't know. I'm not too worried about it. Okay. So last head. If first head is null, first head is cell. Otherwise, last head dot next is cell. So last head is going to be the end of the linked list of heads that we're building here. And then down here, last head equals cell. So we advance. This is so much easier to explain with a, with a... Hang on. Let's bring it back up again. It's not my favorite sketch thing, but it did work. Oh, that's not it. Oh yeah, it is. Okay. La -di -da. Yeah, clear this um, new uh, graph paper. Create. Cool. So right now we are looping over every cell. Um, text. Overthinking it. Okay, fill 100. Yep. Um, line width, line height. Where's the size? Whatever. Uh, 
uh, for every cell. Okay. Um, oh, what I mean is for every head cell. So we find every cell that is a head, right? Which is here. For each cell, if it's a head, um, if our first head is null, like that, and our last head is null, so we have a new we have a new head, and we need to add it to the list. But there is no list; the list is null. So we say, forget that. Um, so let's call this A, B, C. Uh, we've got head A, head B, head C. So we need to add head A to the list. So we, we change first head from being null to being A. And last head also becomes A. And now we go to B. So head B, how do we add it to the list? Well, you might say add it to, you know, point, point first head dot next is B. Put it here. But actually, we want to do, we want to do this. Um, we want to do last head. So remember, right now, last head and first head are the same. Um, I'll do it like this. A, B, C. So right now, first head is here and last head is here. So we have a list. Right now it's just A. And we want to add B. So we say last head dot next is B. And then we say last head is now B. So first head still points to A. Last head is now the last element in this list, which is B. And when we add C, we say last head dot next is C. Last head is C. When we're done, we don't have to worry about last head. First head now references the first head in a list of heads that we can iterate over by going next, 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 next. So that's what this is. If first head is null, then first head is cell. Otherwise, last head dot next is cell. Last head is cell. And we're going to do the exact same thing for tails, except we're going to make sure that every time I say head in here, I change it to tail. So that's cool. Um, and then we want to render them. But we no longer want to pass all the cells in. We want to pass in um, first head, first tail. And actually, we're going to want to do this in every uh, place that we update the renderer. And we're going to change the renderer now. Uh, here, instead of cells, we're going to say um, first, uh, sorry, uh, heads and tails. And instead of iterating over all the cells, we're going to say for let cell equal heads, cell isn't null, cell is cell dot next. In other words, we are now doing the same thing. We are setting, so the, the, the GUI is saying, OK, the cell is the first. Um, and we're going to do something, and then we're going to say cell is cell.next. Cell is cell.next. Cell is cell.next. And we're going to stop when cell is null. So that's how we can use a classic for loop to uh, loop through a linked list. Um, and in here, we can just grab this. Um, color, we already know the color, cell.x times width cell.y, cool. Um, 
and then color is going to be head color. And we're going to say const head color equals um, states to whoops states to colors dot get cell state dot head. And we can do the exact same thing with tails. We're going to change this to tail color. Tail color, tail, same thing, just next, and then cool. So keep in mind, we just simplified the runtime of update paper because it was it was looping over every active cell, including wires. Now it doesn't touch the wires at all. It loops only over the heads and the tails. Let's see what that looks like. Still works. Good to see. Okay. Now, of course, when we advance, nothing happens because we need to uh, rewrite the update function to operate on these lists instead of, um, you know, iterating over every cell. So that's the first step. Engine GUI. I'm not comfortable committing this just yet because it doesn't run, right? Or like it thinks it's running, but it's not running. And in fact, I wonder if it's spitting out errors. Oh, it's not. But that makes sense, because even though the update function isn't doing anything it's supposed to be doing, um, you know, this wouldn't be throwing any errors. It's just looking at old state, which doesn't exist anymore. So we can get rid of all of this code. And now we should write down what changes need to happen. So for this to advance, if we imagine we have a list of all heads and a list of all tails, what do we need to do? Well, we can remember the rules. Dead stay dead, we're not worried about them. Tail cells always become wire cells. So turn all tails to wires. Head cells always become tail cells. Turn all heads to tails. And then wire cells get excited. Wire cells touching one or two head cells become head cells. Otherwise, they stay wire cells. Um, so um, generate list, generate new list of heads from heads. OK. Some of these we can do immediately. So turn all tails to wires. We've already got a list, first tail, of, um, of tails. So we can say for let cell uh, equals first tail, cell isn't null, cell is cell dot next. So for every cell in the tails list, and what makes a wire? cell dot is wire cell dot is wire is true and let's see is this going to work hang on because cell is cell dot next. Let's try this again. So for every cell, cell is wire is true, and Okay, I'm going to demote this from a for loop to a while loop. So let tail equals first tail. Uh, 
while tail isn't null. Uh, let next equal tail dot next. Tail dot is wire is true. Tail dot next is false. Tail equals next. Let's look this over. So we're basically getting rid of a list. Do we really worry about whether tail.next is false? No, we don't. That can continue to be that way. Okay, I'm going to go back to the more understandable... There we go. Cell.isWire is true. Okay, that's fine. The connections between cells can still exist. You're looping through linked lists in several places. Are there macros in JavaScript or some other way to accomplish don't repeat yourself? Uh, there are. Why don't we try that? So to do after implementing strategy three, um, maybe write a function that takes a linked list and an operation and a function. I'll just rewrite this. Maybe write a for each for linked lists. That's really what you're talking about. Um, and it would be cool if we could leverage that here. The main reason we can't leverage this here is because first head and first tail are kind of free-floating variables in engine's top-level scope. So if we instead made an object that holds on to a first node, that can be null. So like maybe we could try this. We could say uh, maybe make a class. That's something that I'll try after actually getting strategy three to work. Um, only because, you know, actually getting this to work is my top priority tonight. Okay, so we've turned all the tails into wires. But we also need to say that they're wires. So, let's see. Turn tails to wires. Turn all heads to tails. And then turn new heads. Here. Turn all tails to wires. Set tails to heads. Set heads to new heads. That's what I'm getting at. Okay. So we just kind of demoted these cells from tails to wires up here. And then we can just say tails uh, first tail equals first head. We don't have to loop over any of the heads to turn them into tails. The state change is no longer necessary and they are already in a completely suitable list structure. So we can just boom. We with this simple, uh, you know, assignment, we are turning the list of heads into a list of tails. And then up here, let new heads. Um, we're gonna say first head. Oopsie. This is gonna be new first head. And here, first head equals new first head. self-documenting. At least I feel that way. So, generate new list of heads from heads. So how do we do that? Well, we definitely need to loop over all the heads. For let head equal first head head oh, cell. Let cell equal first head. Cell isn't null. 
cell is cell.next. Okay. We're then going to look at every neighbor of the cell. So for let neighbor, uh, for let i equals zero, i is less than, and then up here we're gonna say uh, let num neighbors, I'm just gonna keep it outside this loop so we don't have to keep declaring a const. I don't know if that's premature optimization or not, but whatever. For i is zero, i is less than num neighbors, i plus plus. Num neighbors is cell dot num neighbors. Uh, neighbor equals cell dot neighbors i. And then if neighbor dot is wire. So instead of checking whether the state, the current state, is equal to wire or something like that, we've got this simple little boolean, wire or not. And then we're gonna say, um, let's see. Oh, you know what else? Um, head count. I'm gonna set head count to minus one. Okay. Here we are. So if head count, oh, if neighbor dot head count is equal to negative one. In other words, if we haven't counted this uh, this um, this neighbor yet, then neighbor dot headcount is zero. Now I'll just start it off as one. And if new first head is null, then we also need a last last first head is null. new first head equals neighbor else last first head dot next equals neighbor and up here we're also going to say neighbor dot next is null so whatever next values were sitting on this cell they get wiped um, and how do we know that that's safe? How do we know that this neighbor isn't already in this list of new ones? Well, the list only contains cells that have a head count. Um, oh, I guess zero is fine. Okay, okay. Zero, okay, is equal to zero. Then it's one. else neighbor dot headcount plus plus. And then last, oh, not last first head, new last head. Okay. New last head equals neighbor. So again, we are building out um, the linked list of new heads. Let's go through this again. For every head, for every neighbor, if it's a wire, then if we haven't counted it yet, we start the count, we null its next, and we add it to the list of new heads. Otherwise, we increment its head count. So, this add all wire neighbors of heads to 
new heads list and count their head neighbors. Now the problem is this list, new first head to new last head, likely contains cells with too many neighbors that are heads. Their head count is too high. So now we gotta weed them out. Starting with new first head. For all we know, new first head, while new first head dot head count is greater than two. Uh, new first head dot, give me a second. New first head dot head count is zero. And new first head is new first head dot next. What's this do? We're literally taking the front, like the first, the first cell in uh, the linked list of new heads, and we're throwing it away and replacing it with what it was pointing to if its head count was too high. And we know that we don't need to worry about the opposite where there's not enough heads because everything in the new heads list has a head count of at least one. So remove, um, remove first new head until, until it Remove cells from front of list until first cell is a valid new head. That's what we want. And then it's just another simple for loop. Remove cells from list until uh, if they are invalid. For let cell equals new first head. I'm renaming these again. New first head becomes first new head. La new last head becomes last new head. Okay. For let cell is first new head cell isn't null, cell is cell.next. I just realized in chat, you were talking about macros in JavaScript so that we wouldn't have to incur the cost of running functions. And that's fair. JavaScript doesn't have any macros. Or it does, but they're like whether or not to use certain kinds of syntax or something like that. Um, the macros that you're talking about are something that would be interpreted by a compiler. And because of the style of JavaScript that I'm writing, I am trying to avoid compiler steps, at least for vanilla JavaScript. Uh, zero frameworks, modern features, rich taste, caramel notes, short and sweet, smooth consistency via prettier. I don't want to introduce a compiler step to what is just going to be jitted and executed by the browser. Um, now, when we get to things like WebAssembly, right, the, uh, the stuff that is kind of like the equivalent of the Flash uh, crossbridge quick memory opcodes, when we get to that, there's inevitably going to be a compiler step. Um, but we'll cross that bridge when we reach it. Oh my god, that's probably where Crossbridge's name came from. Not that it matters, because it's gone. Moving on. If um, cell.headcount if cell.next.headcount 
is greater than two. While. Oh, you know what? We can just copy and paste this. While, not first new head, but cell dot next dot head count. While cell dot next dot head count is greater than two, cell dot next dot head count is zero. Cell dot next equals cell dot next dot next. That's confusing. Let me see if I can improve the readability of this. Let next, do I use that anywhere? No, equals cell dot next. Is that any better? While next dot head count. There's probably a convention for writing these variables so that they're not confusing. So this basically chews up and spits out any cell after this cell I could do this head new head new head dot next cell cell. Let cell is new head dot next and then we do the same thing here as up there. Next, cell dot head count is less than or equal to two. Cell is cell dot next. Nope, we don't want that. I owe you an explanation, so let's pop open the sketch pad again. I have no idea where it keeps. Uh, I see. Uh, delete. Okay, new diagram, graph paper, create. So we have a list of cells called new heads. Let's make it these. And they all have a head count, which is the number of neighbors that they have that are heads. And so let's say it's like four, uh, three, one, three, one, three. Let's try this. Uh, and then two, just to give myself a bit of a tail, two, Okay, so up here we're saying remove cells from the front of the list until the first cell is a valid new head. So while the first new head, so first new head is f, while first dot head count is greater than two, first head count is zero, and move to the next. So it's greater than two, so we set it to zero. 
and we advance. We set it to zero and we advance. This one is no longer greater than two. So this is where first ends up. And then we say for new head, so I'll call this H, for new head is first new head. New head isn't null, new head is new head.next. Okay. Cell is new head next. So cell is new head next. While cell head count is greater than two, cell head count is zero, cell cell.next. So cell head count No, but this does work. Okay. While cell head count is greater than two, set hell count to zero and cell cell dot next. So just like this, we're gonna say this is now zero, and we're gonna move cell to here. But down here we need to say new head dot next equals cell. In other words, once this cell is done advancing, we need to relink it like that. Okay, and then we go back up to this for loop. New head is new head dot next. Uh, yep. So now this is new head dot next, and cell is uh, deallocated. This is old. Oh, I forgot to persist the, okay. So, right, so new head dot next. Okay, yeah, this, this makes sense. So we aren't interested in this. This is the first, so it's like, it's as if these don't even matter because that's the first node. And it's next was changed in the loop to go here. And then cell is new head dot next. While cell head count is greater than two, this becomes zero. And cell is cell dot next. While cell head count is greater than two, it is not greater than two. New head next is cell. And then new head is new head dot next. We get rid of this. Um, and again, that is no longer true, it's down here. And then this becomes new head. And cell is new head next. While cell head count is greater than two, it is not. New head next is cell. Already was. Um, and then This is the head, this is the cell. While cell dot head count is greater than two, cell head count is zero. And remember, this is the end of the um, this is the end of the linked list, and we are making sure that uh, all of the cells going into this list have null as their next um, until we connect them. Uh, so then uh, cell is cell.next, which is null. Uh, new head next is null. New head is now null. So let's look at this messy result. First dot next dot next dot next dot next. And that is the correct answer. As messy as that is.
we should give this a spin. Clear, reset, advance, runtime error. Let's see what's complaining. Null is not an object. Headcount. Pop this out. Ah, uh, yeah. So I wonder if there's a better algorithm that avoids this potential that cell is null. Let new head is first new head. Maybe we could say new head dot next isn't null. New head is new head dot next. Cell is new head next. Cell head count is greater than two. We set it to zero. Oh yeah, and down here also. Uh, new head dot no while cell isn't null and cell head count is greater than two Cell head count is zero. Yeah, this is fine. And in the meantime, new head dot head count is zero. Every every entry into new heads has to become has to get a head count of zero by the time it exits this function. So these first new heads that have too high a head count, their head count becomes zero. Um, these new heads here that have a head count that's too high, they become zero. Let's try that. Advance. Well, that's broken. Okay. We are going to test this against a simpler system. Bar world, repo, examples. I'm going to borrow one from Golly. Uh, clocks. Okay. Remember, orange is head and uh, yellow is tail. So that's correct. This is correct. Cell is wire is true, that's correct. These nexts are null. Okay. 
I'm going to comment this out just briefly. So we can confirm that the bug is with our code that evaluates, yeah, that evaluates new heads. Yes, okay. And I can also comment out the part that removes uh, cells that have too many. Cool, okay. So the bug is in this code, which is not too surprising. Um, I will comment this out. No, that's not very helpful because this first new head stuff is actually pretty uh, un um, No, I can do that. I can comment this out. And put in clocks. What's nice about clocks is the... Wow, look at that. They just vanish. Uh, oh! Is wire! That's why. Okay. Okay. The wires are still counting themselves as wires. That's what's going on. <laughs> so if neighbor is wire... First new head. New head dot is wire equals false. Let's see if that fixes this. It seems to. Let's hit turbo. We're seeing some significant speed up. We're already at 15,000 generations. If we had taken um, Joseph Sachs's advice a couple episodes ago and written a unit test, we'd be able to be more confident that the code is working properly because we'd have like every single possible scenario enumerated. But the fact that the Wireworld computer is computing is a good sign. Okay, let's see what happens if this 60 becomes 90. Okay, it's starting to slow down. We are reaching a kind of limit based on the speed at which the functions can run in JavaScript. But still, this is blazing fast. Um, and we can find out actually where the slow parts are with a feature of Chrome's Web Inspector that I was not familiar with until this past week. So if we bring this up in Chrome and we turn on the Turbo and in the Web Inspector we go into Performance and start it and start the... And I'll just stop it around 20,000 generations. The performance profiling in Chrome. So here's our flame chart. And it's complaining that we are exceeding the, the frequency of the animation frame, which is understandable. Um, you know, we will, we will disc <laughs> back to 60. We will figure that out in either a future episode or later in this episode. Uh, but 
The cool thing about this isn't the flame chart. There's nothing surprising in the flame chart, right? The update function is taking the majority of the frame. Here we go over budget, uh, and then a tiny little update paper. Uh, what's, what's cool about profiling the performance in the Chrome DevTools is when you go back into sources, and we saw an example of it just there, but if we go into uh, some of these files, like data, we don't see anything in, we don't see anything new. GUI utils, nothing new. But GUI JS, there's this wide margin next to the line numbers, and it uses the margin to tell us where in the file the work was taking place. We ran this thing for however long, let's see, How long did we run it? About 16 seconds. Of those 16 seconds, update paper was calling this stuff and it's like 41 milliseconds here, 12 milliseconds there, 39 milliseconds there. Practically nothing is going on in update paper, which is fantastic because at the end of the day, we don't want drawing this thing to compete with the browser's interactivity for frame budget. Um, we know that engine is taking up the frame budget. That's nothing new. We know what's going on here, right? Um, but what's more interesting is like what operations are the expensive ones in this file? Um, not a whole lot here. Not a whole lot here. Here's where it gets to be a bigger deal. 5,000 of this, sorry, five seconds, five and a half seconds of the 16 seconds were spent on this line. Two seconds were spent on this line. And then downstream of that, very little time was spent because most of the neighbors of heads, it's like they're few and far between, right? Here again, we've got all the heads, but here, like I said, like we can see, uh, only 38 milliseconds have ever been spent in those past 16 seconds weeding out a single node from the front, like any nodes from the front of the list. And that's just circumstantial. You know, there could easily be an edge case that we have to include this code in here to, to handle. Um, you know, removing cells from the front of the new head list. Um, two seconds went into this for loop, which is unfortunate. It would be cool if we could get away from iswire, maybe by... No, I don't want to chance it. There could be some optimization here. I just, I don't think so. Most of the work being done is up here. And I think it has to be done. Let's go back into performance and look at bottom up, update in run, in function call, not very helpful. Animation frame fired, run was called. Oh no, that's that's the call tree, so I mean we know this. Bottom up has no granularity. Okay, bottom line, real pleased with this. Gonna run prettier. 
I have no idea what it did because I didn't stage my changes first. Um, his wire, first head and tail, prettier changed that. Um, That's interesting. It surrounded those down here in parentheses, which I dislike so much that I will just put them on separate lines. Thank you. Same here. No thank you. I doubt this is much of an optimizing... I doubt this will have much impact. Most most of the changes that I can make from this strategy from here on out are... Um, I'll see diminishing returns, right? Cell.neighbors... Cell.neighbors I... I mean, this isn't going to speed things up considerably at all. Uh, clear... It looks faster, but that's only because I actually reduced the, um, you know, the number of uh, 18,000, 19,000, 20,000. Okay. And stop. I reduced the number of iterations in the, um, like, look at this. We're under budget all of a sudden, which is nice, but I mean, I just changed a hard-coded number. We are just under budget, just barely. What are these? Yeah, good for you. Okay. Sources. Yeah, no difference. Neighbors, neighbors eye takes up, you know, five and a half thousand out of however many seconds this is. So, you know, this change, I'm just going to back it out because it doesn't actually make that big a difference. So, you know, there are, there are minutia that actually I, I was guilty of introducing a couple of those into this code tonight. But, you know, there are, there are small things that people sometimes put in their JavaScript code because they heard at some point somewhere that some browser uh, liked it better that way. That's not a technique that you want to apply. Everything that we've done so far has been changing the nature of this problem from the naive approach where we're literally <laughs> running a pile of loops and if statements over every pixel in the image to now where our update function update, uh, become a wire for every cell yeah um, 
So the strategy we have now, which is basically for every head, look at your neighbors and, uh, you know, increment. I mean, let's, let's actually compare these different strategies. So I'm going to call this strategy comparison. Um, naive approach so we were iterating over half well half a million dead cells so about uh, what am I trying to say here I want to compare their runtime big O notation and when I say big O notation I mean the upper bound of their running time. I don't want to compute their actual running time. There are just rules of thumb based on the algorithms that you write that allow you to determine like what the uh, what the asymptote, like what the prevailing trend as the program continues to run, uh, what that trend, uh, you know, how that trend behaves. So for example, if you are looping over an array, it, you know, when you say something like for every element in an array, dot dot dot, no matter what you're doing, the running time of your program is going to be directly proportional to the length of that array, right? Where n equals array size. If you say for every person at this party, for every other person at this party, make them shake hands, right? Something like that. Well, then that's going to be O n times n, where again, where n is number of people at the party. You're looping over them, and you're looping over them again. So, I mean, someone might say, well, isn't it like O n n minus 1? Well, yes, but if you take this trend to infinity, if you run this thing forever, then that minus 1 uh, kind of dissolves away. Or, sorry, not just when you run it forever, but when you uh, increase n to enormous numbers. Uh, it's going to be n times n, or n squared. So what was the naive approach? The naive approach was O n times m, where n is rows, m is columns, which is huge, right? We were doing logic on all of the pixels. Strategy one, um, it was O n, where n equals, uh, let's see, don't loop over dead cells, list the non-dead cells, right. So n equals number of non-dead cells. And by the way, we know these values more or less, so this was approximately uh, half a million and this was approximately uh, 50,000 although there was another there was another um, factor in this which is for all of these cells uh, we were also looking at that 3x3 three three grid. Did that contribute to the big O notation? Not really, because it was constant. Okay, so... Strategy 1 and 2. 
were both O-N, where N is the number of non-dead cells, which is approximately 50,000. Strategy three, tonight's strategy, is O-N, where N is number of heads. Which is approximately 5,000. That is why it is this fast. We should race it against the Flash version. One second. Localhost. And. Okay, so there's a chance that the Flash version um, makes Turbo a number other than 60. So we're going to try 30. No, we, we already know that at 60 we still haven't beaten our frame budget. So I'm going to leave it at 60, and if it is still slower than Flash, I'm going to crank this up and see what value it has to be for them to be equal. And I will use the timer on the menu bar starting now. And I'll turn it off when the number here, oopsie, I forgot. The flash version freezes the uh, engine when there are mouse events. So I'm going to restart this. I'm not going to move the mouse. When the last digit when the displayed digit turns to 5, that's when I will stop the simulation. It's going to be a while. 20 seconds so far. seconds. Okay, 45 seconds on the dot. And that's a, that's a generation of about 103,000. So now we're going to do the same thing, but in uh, JavaScript. Turbo is on. We're just going to wait. There we go. I was going to say we're going to wait till uh, the clock is at the minute mark, but it was immediately at the minute mark. Okay, so it is running slower than the Flash version. It reached three, about nine seconds slower, but we're going to change, you know what? I'll change it immediately. So we're going to change this to 90. Oh, I'll wait till the minute mark. 10 seconds. Two, three. It's going to take a sip. Still slower by about five seconds. 120. The reason, by the way, that I'm comfortable doing this is that I know for a fact that the Flash player um, does not expect any user input in the first place and will pause the engine when there's user input. Um, we still have the page uh, rendering. waiting for the minute to go. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, go. OK, 
Okay, so roughly the same time. I think we're maxing out, as a matter of fact. Let's just see what happens when I set it to 240. And I'll start on 45. It is chugging, so we are heavily um, impacting the draw speed. I'll be honest with you, I lost complete track. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, it took exactly a minute to reach five on Flash, so I'm going to wait till the half a minute mark to start this and see where we're at in 30 seconds. Okay. You have to admit, it's very impressive that Flash was able to support a program like this 10 years ago that can still compete with JavaScript. Of course, it's leveraging a trick that we aren't yet. And coming up on the minute mark, They are practically neck and neck. If I set the uh, turbo to 120. Let me find out what the turbo is in the ActionScript project, because I have the code right here. Uh, source, net, resmason, wireworld, controller. Update overdrive. Back then it was called overdrive. And then overdrive speed. Overdrive climb. That's right. It would like climb up from zero. So the flash code throttles itself, and it accelerates. Model update, times six, that makes sense. I is less than overdrive speed. I really have no idea what overdrive speed is, like what the value is. Wish I did. Does it have a limit? Overdrive speed plus plus. No idea. Good stuff, though. I'm committing this. Prettier again. Just going to look everything over. Oh, 
I'm not going to do that. We're going to leave turbo at 60 just for now. Um, that's good. Strategy 3 is done. We still have an hour left. Um, I want to fix some bugs. But... Honestly, I first want to do this little bit of cleanup here. Canvas drawing, isolate to its own module. Okay. Implemented strategy 3. How do these code commits? Let's see. Strategy 2. Okay, so I say strategy 3. Use linked lists. Kind of create linked lists from cells. Create linked lists of heads and tails from cells. Update them. Uh, yeah, quite a few changes so far. Uh, update them. Generate new heads list from neighbors of old heads list. And then these paper functions. And you know what the paper paper functions can stay where they are, I think. And this I might try after fixing these bugs. Okay. Right. Uh, advance, uh, isolated, update from engines, advance function. Turbo button now changes number of times update is called from engines run function from 1 to 60. Actually, so I should add um, clever turbo behavior. Okay. So, one thing we haven't talked about really in this episode is what do we do about this, right? This isn't just because I'm recording everything on my screen. Um, the frame budget is, is impacted by... Or maybe it's the scripting, actually. Give me a second. It might be that the code that I'm running in... The GUI is... Okay. Performance, record. So that's, that's nice and fast, right? And this is nice and fast. And this seems responsive. And then this is janky. Okay, stop. So now we can look at these four different periods. I, I probably should have done this in Firefox. It's got a better flame chart. Okay, so here's the flame chart. Um, this is me shaking the screen around. Is it? Hang on. Mouse move. Update pan. Yeah. So this empty 
flame chart, this very sparse flame chart, is where I was moving it around all by itself. This was when I was moving it around and it was updating, I think. It's hard to tell, isn't it? Maybe this is when I was moving it around. Yeah, this is when I was moving it around and it was updating. Basically, anywhere that the update function is big is when it was in turbo mode. And animation frame, animation frame, animation frame. And then over here, where is it? layer tree, pointer out, could that be it, this tiny little, okay, so maybe what it's competing with is the work the browser has to, yeah, okay. Okay, by going over budget, everything that the browser does to update the UI is slightly affected, causing that jank. We will address that in a future episode by taking this engine and putting it on a different thread using web workers, which I know nothing about. Uh, we are basically, you know, strategy three basically marks the current limit of my progress on any wire world implementation. Uh, not including the fact <laughs> that the Flash version used Crossbridge uh, to speed things up. So we're done with this strategy notes thing. Okay, time to fix some bugs. Loading a file resets the engine's speed incorrectly. So... If we set the speed like that, and then... So it's nice and slow. And then we load in clocks. It's going fast again, so that's the problem. Um, why is it going fast again? Because engine reset is probably doing some speed stuff that it shouldn't. Min delay, delay. Maybe not. Console.log rhythm data. Just the console, please. Oh, filtered, clear filters, thank you. Okay, so that changes the speed. And then when we load in clocks, it updated the speed. Okay, so the problem isn't an engine. The problem is with rhythm, GUI.state, GUI so the problem is in GUI. Um, speed equals, okay, state equals reset, reset, oh, Okay, so const reset equals state from initial state, and initial state has a speed still of, oh, I see, okay. So, 
state.speed equals, okay, hang on. Const speed equals state.speed. State.speed equals speed. We don't want to override the speed. Cool. Clocks. Cool. I think that's a bug fixed. That's fixed. Cool. To do loading a file, boom. Um, now, the thing about changing speed with keys behaves strangely is about the fact that. So, right now I'm holding down the speed up key, and right now I'm holding down the slow down key. And if I do speed up and then slow down, it does that. Slow down and then speed up, it does that. It's a little weird. Let's try zoom in and zoom out. Oops. Um, there we go. Zoom in. It seems like it goes twice as fast when you do one and then the other, and that's kind of weird. That would be a bug in probably GUI utils and make slider. Listen for wheel, event listener, animate slider. Map to, okay, here we go. Decrease button, decrease key mapping. Okay, so map key to mouse event. I think. How much do I want to further complicate this code? Not that much. Speed. Begin animated slider. Here's what I'll do. Okay. Animate slider. Cool. Set value. Okay. I should check and see if it's already animating. If animated delta isn't equal to zero. Try that. So now I'm going to hold the zoom in button and then zoom out button. Does nothing. Okay, yes, it does. <laughs> okay, so if animated delta isn't zero and animated delta isn't. No, this is fine and animated slider if animated delta isn't equal to amount sorry equals amount there we go and then end animated slider These two get a minus, and then amount event. Let's try that. 
zoom in, zoom out. Okay, so now the key that is opposite the key that's currently down is completely ignored. And zoom in. As weird as all this is, I think this is how I want it to be. No, no it isn't. Ugh, okay, hang on. I don't want to rely on animated delta at all, actually. What do I want to do? I want... Let... State equal idle and we're going to keep a track of the state so begin animated slider is going to get state amount end animated slider is going to get state look at these. Mouse up, touch end, mouse leave. Um, those can be null. State equals null. say if state oh new state if new state isn't null and okay if state is idle state is new state. Else, state is both. this. Now this is all gross. <laughs> so what I'll do instead is keep it super simple End animated slider changes the delta to zero. That is fine. Begin animated slider is literally not going to do anything.
if the animated delta is already a non-zero value. isn't equal to zero, return. Okay. Interesting. Log animated delta. Zero. So return. No, that should just plain work. Is value equal to zero? <sighs> value is equal to zero. Okay. Set value, slider dot set value. bug already existed. Great! Okay. New bug. <laughs> okay. So... Set value. Console.log value if I do that. Oh boy. This is what I get for making my own components out of HTML controls. So why are you up there? Input 
value is 1. GUI initial state speed console.log initial state dot speed should be 1. 1. Okay. So then speed slider is make slider speed slider dot value Forget if it's a setter. Set value. It just so happens to be a setter. Okay. So back in GUI, slider value equals state dot speed. That's weird. So now it's value. Sources, just going to extend this, pop it out, give us a little more room to work in. Okay. Uh, GUI, speed, slider dot value. Never mind the syntax highlighting, that's because there's some weirdness in Safari. So speed slider dot value, step in, set, set value value, if value is less than zero, well value is undefined. That's why. <laughs> Ugh. I'm going to take a page from this, parse float. GUI utils, make slider, value equals parse float, range input dot value, so that the default value is what populates it. Let's try that. That's more like it. Okay. I'm now happy again with my UI elements, at least in Safari. I will test them real quick in Firefox. And I know there's some weird stuff going on in Chrome, so I will address that next. Um, got to make sure my cache is clear. There's got to be a way to disable the cache for real in, um, let's see, clear data. Yep, clear now. Okay. doesn't work properly is a general problem from the, the looks of it, but I will do this. So that's two bugs so far fixed. 
um, fixed a slider initial value bug, a slider keyboard event bug, and come to think of it, initial state shouldn't have a speed at all. No, it should. It should. We have to get that speed from... Uh... Okay, yeah, this is fine. And an a, a bug where speed speed was reset when loading a new file. Okay. Push that. Okay. So in Safari, when I click a button and then press play, there's logic going on behind the scenes that goes, okay, this is a keyboard shortcut. It happens to be a space. When a component has focus and you press space, the user's expectation is that that component receives a click event. But in Safari, and rightly so, this button doesn't have focus. I will verify this. Document dot, uh, what are they called? Document, active element. Active element is the body. That makes sense. Click. Again, active element is the body. Only when I start hitting tab should the active element active element be reported to be a button or something like that. Okay. That's what I'm expected. That's what I've expected based on my experience in Safari. In Firefox, let's try this again. Uh, dock it. Uh, to the right. Let me try to... Um, settings dark mode <laughs> there we go okay oopsie all right um, inspector and reduce the size of that okay document active element is body I click this active element active element is input not what I expected. What's this? Markup JS. Dev tools. Okay. A warning in the dev tools. Whatever. So document document development dot MDN is focused. Has focus. Okay. False. And now it should be true. Oh. Oh, because it loses focus when I frickin'... Okay. Uh, how do I fix this? I want to inspect the document on every frame. Wireworld.js. Uh, request animation frame. Uh, snitch focus. Const snitch focus equals 
console.log document has focus. It might be that simple. It might be. Let's try this. Okay. Nothing has focus. Now something does. That is really annoying. Because ideally, if nothing seems to have focus, pressing play and pause should, you know, cause the, uh, oh, sorry, pressing the space bar should cause the simulation to play and pause. And then you click a button and it should play and pause still. But if I click that and I press space bar, it's as if it has focus, but it's not, sh it doesn't have the focused state. Firefox focused element doesn't look focused. Not what I'm looking for. So here's what's curious to me. Why do the browsers not conform with this? So this thing says that there is a focus. Kind of always, huh? Okay, so has focus is useless to me. I might have to look this up in my own time. Um, although I do try to get the bugs that I find fixed on stream, ideally. Active element. So in GUI, active element, that's what I will snitch next. We'll just call this snitch console log document active element uh, dot tag name document. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So it's body. I click this, still body. Click this, still body. Start hitting tabs. And it changes. Let's look at Firefox's behavior. There we go. Body. I click this, input, and it's still input. So, Firefox active element
Which elements are focusable depends varying on the platform and the browser's current configuration. Okay, so I'm making an unsafe assumption here. doing or something that it's doing? Oops. Enter. Drag enter. No. That's something that it's doing. I'm hitting the enter key to see what happens. Interestingly, hitting the space bar in Safari turns a focused checkbox on and off. Hitting enter does not. Also, what did I do to break that? <laughs> Great, another thing to look into. All right. I'm going to look at that again, just because I was in there just recently. So, map key to mouse event, decrease button, decrease key mapping, make slider, GUI, bracket left, bracket right. So, and button slow buttons fast. Um, console.log. There we go. So I press enter, space, no difference. Even though it looks like the button is being pressed, the button is not being pressed. That button gets pressed. This one doesn't seem to. It's so strange. Okay, so make slider, decrease button, add event listener, Mouse down, touch start, touch up, touch end. Maybe it's dispatching a different, a, a different event. MDN button events. down here and I select this and hit space. Huh. So what's that do? If I hit space on here, it doesn't say left button clicked. I was looking at mouse event button, that's why. Okay, so... Methods... What events do you broadcast? Doesn't say. 
um, HTML button press event. This is unbelievable. Because typically browsers will trigger uh, kind of fake mouse down and mouse up events as far as far as I can tell. So let's see, mouse down on decrease button. Console.log. Tab over to here. No mouse down event at all. Um, wow. What good is a button? Okay, let's see what the difference is between those buttons and play, pause, listen to button is in here, and I'm listening for click. Okay. begin or end are triggered, but if I add a click, console.log, it creates a click event on mouse up. Button, mouse down, space bar. Capturing mouse down event on HTML button. When button, using the keyboard. Okay, this is the right question. Is there an answer? for Pete's sake. Okay. So I need to add key down and key up to these as well. And also to the increase button. And key down is begin animated slider speed. Except it's um sanitize key and here sanitize key and this one is end animated slider and this one is begin animated slider speed gross 
just gross. So, sanitize key. Funk event if event dot repeat return console dot log event funk. Let's just do that for now. Right. Funk event. Maybe it's because of all the prevent default that I've packed in here. Funny. Okay. If event repeat, return. Uh, and then event needs to be space or enter. Space. There it is. Uh, whoops, GUI utils. Console log. If event dot uh, code is space or event dot code is I guess enter funk event That's fixed. Cool, a bug I didn't even know was there. Um, console.log. Oh. oh. Where is it? 135. GUI. 135. Better prettier. Test it in other browsers. That works. Uh, maybe don't prevent default in those cases. Why am I doing prevent default? Drag enter. Oh, that's sorry. Here we go. Begin animated slider. I'll just try commenting this out and see what happens. change. So weird. Let's try Chrome. Clear cached files. Yep, space that works. Probably behavior that it inherited from WebKit back in the day. Maybe not.
Okay. So I still have this bug where Firefox and Chrome um, give focus to, <laughs> invisibly to last clicked um, element. Kinda sorta. Um, it's especially weird that Firefox wouldn't update the appearance of these buttons to be in the down state. Let's see if... Getting rid of these keyboard events causes it to suddenly work. Ah! Okay. Firefox doesn't... Okay, at least it's consistent. So Firefox does not update the button states of items just because you are tapping them with the space or enter keys when you focus. Which is kind of weird. Um, maybe I should do that. Can I do that? CSS, JavaScript, manually focus. Or, um, hover. How to add hover manually with JavaScript. Toggle a hover class. You cannot modify a pseudo class using JavaScript. Okay, so Firefox, pseudo class, focused press. Whatever. Okay. I'll keep this event prevent default in, just because I don't quite understand well enough what it's doing. And I'll commit this. Uh, slider buttons are now pressed and released when hitting the space or uh, enter keys while they are focused. We've got an unresolved bug that lasted a whole episode, which is unfortunate, but I'm pretty happy with the progress that we made tonight. This is the, you know, for the past three episodes, the focus has been working smarter, not harder, right? Not leveraging any of the uh, um, abilities of the browser to um, reduce the amount of load on the rendering, on like the main thread of this uh, of this business logic of updating Wireworld as fast as possible. Um, you know, we haven't done WebAssembly, we haven't done uh, web workers, anything like that. Um, we've just focused on making the problem easier. And apart from those diminishing returns that I, re I referenced uh, earlier tonight, um, I would say that we are at a local maximum. Or a local extremum. Like, this is as fast as this notion of wire world can get. Where the universe is just a bunch of heads and a bunch of tails really just like a bunch of heads that are like dancing across a graph of cells. Um, some ideas for optimizations uh, that I'm probably not going to try during the stream in future episodes, but might be worth considering in the abstract are, you know, the, ma the majority of the work being done every frame, I think, is here in the ROM and in the seven segment displays. And technically, you can trace these 
elements, right? These ones. You can trace them all the way back from this terminus to this single cell. And kind of say, well, everything down from here. Like, there's, there's, a, there's a directionality to it. Most of the time, you can't talk about the directionality of Wireworld because, you know, like, in here, for example, um, I'm trying to catch it in the act. Here we go. So, this train and this train are kind of like they're on the same track, and they are designed to collide. So if we look at this electron, its head is over here and its tail is down here. And this one is on the same wire, its head is down here and its tail is up here. And they are destined to collide. So there's no guaranteed directionality of this wire. Boom. It's up to the designer of the instance. Wireworld doesn't specify that wires have a direction. There's no notion of an act there's no actual notion of a wire in the Wireworld rules. Um, but you know, you can find them. You can find cells that have a graph that bottlenecks like this. And you might be able to make cert you, can, you might be able to you know, detect cases where this thing can be treated specially. Where it doesn't do anything particularly weird um, until, you know, until the simulation updates it. That's going to be a while. But you know, when these things update, they don't look like this. They look like something else. They, they kind of stutter a tiny bit as they refresh their appearance. Um, that optimization is highly context-specific. It really benefits simulations like this. Not every Wireworld simulation is like this. Frankly, most Wireworld simulations are simpler than this. Um, but if somebody wanted to make a more complex Wireworld computer, where maybe, you know, this, uh, this RAM, this, this memory that it has, these instructions, um, extends even further, right? Uh, and the number of uh, digits in the display is, you know, one or two uh, places greater. Um, if they wanted to make a more complex instance, um, you know, they, they could. And, and the optimization strategies might apply, but they might not. I really do think that we've reached, like, a local extreme where... Anything else that we do is a law of diminishing, you know, experiences diminishing returns, um, and uh, might be specific to this particular instance, which is not necessarily the most complex wire world system possible. It just happens to be the one uh, that we've kind of all settled on. Nobody's built out anything further. Um, there are other ways of representing wire world than this one that take extremely different approaches and exploit different characteristics of Wireworld that we don't exploit. Um, Golly, the, you know, Golly.app. Hyperspeed and Golly, Wireworld Primes. Oopsie. Uh, oops. Something else. Back to primes. Zoom in. Zoom in. When, when Golly runs in hyperspeed, you know, like we're already at generation a million. Now, 10 million. Right? These are primes that uh, the um, Flash and JavaScript versions. Whoopsie of Wireworld have never... here, hang on. Uh, set scale 1 to 1. Uh, what, middle? Fit pattern. Here we go, fit pattern. Zoom in. Okay. Um, I have never seen the Wireworld computer reach 89 in a browser. There is somebody who implemented this algorithm called uh, Hashlife in, uh, in the browser. 
but they went through Haskell, which is a language that I don't intend to program in for this project. Um, and there are some characteristics of that uh, example that, while impressive, um, are, are things that I would like to avoid implementing in my own project. Um, so how do we get here? We get here by completely rethinking the way that we represent wire world in memory, right? We took this approach with the strategies that we had. Um, of basically computing the next generation as quickly as possible. But if we want to go millions of generations into the future, there's got to be a, a different, you know, a different way of looking at this problem than uh, incrementing the generation one by one. And we will visit that in a future episode. The next episode is possibly going to be the episode where I try to use web workers for the first time. In the meantime, I will investigate the open bug. It might just be that browsers behave differently with this stuff, and I need to... Um, change the the behavior of buttons it wouldn't be hard to just do away with the um, do away with the spacebar keyboard shortcut for play pause it's just a very intuitive shortcut um, it's a shame it really ought to work in other browsers But progress is not linear, and that bug fix and further optimization is what you can look forward to in the next episode. I'd like to thank you for sticking around and for watching this. Oh, I should say, uh, episodes are now um, on YouTube. Check the link underneath the Twitch uh, the Twitch stream to see where you can uh, watch reruns. Um, I'm just going to quickly check. Too little, too late, but I'm just going to quickly check and make sure I'm recording. I am recording. Good. So, you know, in either a couple hours or a couple days, this episode will make it to YouTube. And uh, you can, I don't know, skim through them and uh, fall asleep listening to them. Uh, or be super excited uh, very occasionally while watching them uh, to your heart's content. From the skybox in the corner of the level, this is Res Mason signing off.